Okay, thank you very much for your presentations. They were all interesting. Now we shall take questions from the guests, but we are very late for lunch, so we have only uh, 10 minutes. Okay. Any questions? No? It, yeah. It, everybody is going to lunch. So I will ask. Huh? Sorry. There? Okay. Uh, thank you for the, all the previous presentations. Actually, I have two small questions regarding the Chinese part. The first one is, um, how, how do you see the part of the raw materials in the cost structure of the steel production? And how uh, do some regulations as, for example, the IMO 2020 affect the, the, the cost of raw materials in, in, in the cost structure of, uh, of steel making? Is that okay, please, Sue? Raw material costs, yes? Excuse me, that's, uh, I, I didn't follow that. Uh, 2020. Uh, no? Yes, the question was how, how do the, the, the raw materials prices uh, weight in the, in, the, in the cost structure of steel making? I mean, if, is the, the volatility of the prices really affecting the, the, the final price and cost of the, of the steel? Uh, yeah, yes, of course. There's, uh, raw material prices, uh, as I mentioned, is very strong. There's, uh, in particular, the iron price is, uh, is very strong, uh, it's, which, uh, to some extent, will support uh, the steel price. Uh, that's why uh, I say that uh, maybe before uh, next March, uh, the steel price will be weakening, but uh, I don't believe there's any, uh, there's a big margin. That's, uh, for example, for HRC today, uh, in Chinese markets, uh, maybe it's around 3,000 to 300 uh, yuan per ton. And uh, I don't know, that's uh, the, the bottom, uh, before it pick up, maybe around 3,000. I don't expect any price below that. Okay, thank you. Yeah. Okay. Any other question? No. Okay. Well, one question for Mr. Tommaso from me. Actually, I think you mentioned this, but I will repeat it again, Typhoon Bay. You say that the global steel market is experiencing a deep revolution which you call deglobalization. Until, let's say, five years ago, we all, or most of us, had really believed in globalization and uh, memorized the concepts of such as free trade, fair trade, comparative advantage, etc., and their positive effects on global trade volume. So what happened at the end? Did the country who had been in favor of such concepts, I mean, of course, the United States, change place? Why did the United States change place? Not for economical reasons, maybe you said. Not uh, because the China uh, <laughs> is becoming number one, maybe, as so a political, you say. Yeah. Okay? All right. Well, basically, the. Uh the model of the deglobalization basically goes back to at least 20, 30 years ago. Mm. So up to five, 10 years ago, the perception was what you were mentioning a few seconds ago. Uh, the issue is that uh, the perception of the threat and the challenges coming from China is becoming bigger and bigger. Uh, it has become bigger in the recent years. I mean, the US have been thinking about, let's say, all the terrorism, the Middle East issue for at least, uh, let's say, 10, 15 years. Um, not putting sufficient attention to the growth of China. Uh, now China, I, I mean, I was mentioning before, China deserves this role in the global scenario and the global economic environment. It will take somehow the lead or a co-leading position with the US in the future. Uh, the perception has changed from the United States because the risk now is perceived to be much bigger than before, and therefore that's the reason why, from my point of view. Okay, thank you, Mr. Tommaso. 
So if there is nothing, okay, please, last question. Özgür Öge from Kardemir. Uh, my question is for uh, Typhoon Bey and Fatih Bey. Uh, as you know, uh, there were some fluctuations in HRC prices, especially uh, it went down around $50 in the last three uh, weeks. Uh, and as far as I know, this is uh, mostly about the uh, incentives in the Ukraine side. So how do you see the effects will be uh, to the prices uh, or uh, is there any uh, short-term uh, uh, short-term plan about these uh, these issues? Uh, so, please inform us about the issue. Çalışıyor mu? Pardon. We didn't see Ukraine impacting the prices, uh, but yes, you're correct. The prices have come down over the past uh, three, four months. Uh, it's a demand and supply situation, and that's what really decides the price. You know, uh, uh, at the same time, when you look at it, the scrap prices came down. Uh, slowly, I think Fatih will mention, we're seeing some uh, uh, reduction on the iron ore prices, maybe slightly. Yeah, there are some fluctuations so, of the yeah, oil price. So, uh, Really, you just have to manage it. I mean, I'm not going to sit here and say the prices tomorrow are going to go back up to $700 <laughs> or it's going to go down to $300. At the end of the day, it's a demand and supply situation. And uh, some people bear up with the cost and sell it, and some people just go ahead and reduce their production. So we just have to wait and see. Yes, and that, if you look at the other markets like Europe or USA, you can see the same fluctuations also there. So this is not unique only for Turkey. Yeah, yeah. You're yes, right. Yes, yeah, we're, yeah. we're talking global. It's yeah. not a Turkey problem. Yeah, yeah. Okay. Thank you. So finally, we come to the final part of our session. I would like to thank our experts for joining today for the informative and interesting